we're not that far from the Commonwealth Shortwave site, which we'll talk about exactly where it is, but we're very close. And I just wanted him to give you an idea of other things in the area and how the people were here all at the same time. So I thought that would be an interesting way to start. Um, I'm not sure if you all have that flyer. Um, I think you're holding one right there. Um, maybe we'll pass, pass them around so everybody can see what the agenda is now that I think about it. So you can see all the people that are going to be speaking. And then we also have a video presentation after Franklin has finished speaking that is going to just blow you away. So um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Franklin so he can talk about the, um, the building itself. Now, Debbie, the building that I'm going to talk about is actually the building that we are more or less all in. You are in a more and more a post 1900 add-on to a very, very illustrious place, the Judson Memorial Church. I must say, I don't think I mentioned this in my CV, but I had a connection to the Judson Church dating back to the 1960s because I had a summer camp instructor at a music and art camp who was named James Waring. If anybody knows this place, you might have heard of the Judson Dance Theater, and he was the head of that. So we learned about the I Ching, we learned about Buddhism, we learned about all sorts of esoteric things from <coughs> Mr. Waring, who was an associate of Rauschenberg, Nam June Pate, Merce Cunningham, uh, Charlotte Mormon, and all the other people who were associated with the Judson Theater and, and Dance Company. Uh, subsequently, uh, I made my career in the arts, and also in historic preservation. And Stanford White was a particular top, and he had a hand in the building of the Judson Church. The background of it is this. First, the neighborhood. <clears throat> I think we all recognize the village is perhaps the capital of America's Bohemia. It's the Paris, or the Left Bank, or the Montmartre, of the US and has been for a couple of hundred years. However, it was around 1900, in the period after the Civil War, it was a point of intersection at which old New York met the New York of the immigrants. And what happened in the evolution of New York, the city's density moved northward from the Battery. And consequently, the so-called good areas moved north. If you know the story of Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence, you see that they moved up from the 30s on Fifth Avenue up towards, oh, somebody built a house, Andrew Carnegie, around 90, 91st Street. It was considered really very outré. But if you were down here, Washington Square North was still where the rich people lived. However, the south side of the park, and particularly further, was an immigrant community. I think there's an early St. Pat version of St. Patrick's not far from here, for the Italian immigrant community who became a particular topic of what came to be this church. And the church was an outgrowth of a missionary effort on the part of a man who has a, 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 a sort of unpronounceable first name, Adoniram. Judson. And Judson was a New Englander who was brought up as a Congregationalist, a non-believer. He had a leap of faith experience due to the death of a friend. He converted to the Baptist religion, which tended to be a bit more fundamentalist and faith-oriented than most of American religion back in those days. More or less, Thomas Jefferson, that type of person, was more typical. They believed in God, but he may have stepped back a little bit. Uh, but the Baptists were different. And they believed in missionary efforts. Judson ended up being the missionary to Burma. And he had a tough time over there. But he was successful eventually. He had a son, Edward. And Edward also became a minister. And his attitude was out, outreach to the immigrant community. And that was what this church was all about. 
And there was a very, very rich Baptist in those days. Does anybody have a guess who it was Rockefeller. right before 1900? Rockefeller. Probably, right, exactly. He was the Jeff Bezos of the year. <laughs> and John D. Rockefeller was not only the richest Baptist, but he was the richest man in America. And back then they said he had 500 million, but that was uninflated money. So they said, if you put it in today's money, about 100 billion. So maybe better. And, and with a lot of clout. And he was approached through Judson and a family that also knew Stanford White to get this church going. And what was the architectural idea? To do something Italian. <coughs> Churches in those days featured Gothic. This was unique. It's Renaissance and they called, now you don't see it. If you just came in here and you haven't walked around the church, you don't know what it is. But it's like a basilica. It has a pediment on one side. It looks like perhaps a Roman or a Greek temple a little bit. But that was the way some of the Renaissance churches, and especially public buildings, were put up in Italy during the Renaissance. But it has one thing that is a dead giveaway to Italian, and that is the Campanile. The Campanile is the tower, which was originally designed as apartments. And it was a, la it was a ladder phase in the building project. First get the church up, and then do this public service dimension, not exactly housing for the homeless, but housing for people who needed support, subsidized housing, that type of thing. So that was the origin of it. The so-called free classical style was what Stanford White perfected. And this, this structure, which you're, you're in the adjacent building, the modern part of it, if you go in there, it's really quite amazing. And it is filled with stained glass windows by John Lafarge. And Lafarge, to many connoisseurs, is said to be much better than Tiffany. Now the difference between Lafarge and Tiffany is Tiffany is known for the innovation of a particular method where he sculpted and painted in glass. The glass had physical dimension. It could be wavy like drapery. It could be hammered. It could also have particles of metal in it that gave it reflective or luminescent qualities. Lafarge, who had worked initially with Tiffany, being that they both believed in innovation, was in a way more traditional. The idea of solid colored glass in layers was a more traditional way to do it. You'd have clear, then you'd have a layer of red or a layer of yellow, and you might etch through it, you might fake um, you might bake um, a, a glazed pigment over it, uh, like an enamel, and you could essentially paint on it. Uh, in that Beaux-Arts style, in keeping with Renaissance revival, I said Stanford White was part of that architecturally, was the revival of the style in art of people like Raphael. So if you see these windows, they look like very colorful and beautiful, Renaissance paintings. One thing that's distinctive about the Judson Church, it is the only complete suite of Lafarge. Lafarge did the whole place. Now there's one window they debate whether Maitland Armstrong did it, and there's another one maybe from somebody else, but there are more than a dozen by Lafarge, and there are nowhere else are there so many. You will see a Lafarge or two at the Metropolitan Museum, you will see one at the Brooklyn Museum, he's very, very, tre you will see one of the National Arts Club. He's a very, very treasured artist, and rather, rather the top. There's another feature in here that I'll mention, and that is, there is a, um, there is facing the park, a barrel vault, a barrel vault entry. You know it. That form is echoed in the structure of the interior of the church, where there are barrel vault ceilings. Now there's a very famous barrel vault on Washington Square. You pass by it all the time. It's the interior of the arch. If you look at the way that is structured, which has sort of a coffered selection of intersecting uh, verticals and horizontals, creating box-like shapes, it's very distinctive. The interior of the church is done with the same method. And incidentally, Stanford White was the designer of the arch, which, which preceded the building of the church. The initial phase of the church building was 1887 to 90, 91, and then 
the Campanile and certain add-ons were done over the next 10 years. So I think that knowing that this was a site that acknowledged and embraced the, the presence of the immigrant community, and also that these factories were in this immediate area, as well as places where the people who worked in those were in Little Italy or further down on the Lower East Side, etc., not far from here, that Judson had the vision, which has been perpetuated in this church, which has so many different phases of outreach to different communities, and it does maintain uh, a religious dimension to it, but it's a religion that's a very uh, outreach-oriented type of experience. So that's my, my, my talk, and I thank you. Thank you, Franklin. Well, now he's, Franklin set the scene for what this area is like, but now you're going to hear about a very different life that was going on so close. So I'm going to, oh, by the way, unfortunately, um, the, the church itself, if you want to see the windows or any of the architecture, today is not the day. Come, come another time. I was just told that we, we don't have permission to walk around freely, but you can come anytime you like and, and you can see everything. And there's some information on their website too. But in the meantime, want to, do you want to lower the lights a little bit? Or what do you think? This is a video. It's about 10 minutes and it was done by Dustin Schrader. And it's all written there too. If you want to see it on your own, it's on YouTube also. But I really want everyone to see it because it's just fantastic. He and his parents drove here or came here from outside of Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Isn't that fantastic? So he's here, he's at the podium, this is his debut. <laughs> pa proud parents were here. And uh, too modest to talk about himself. And he said that we'll just let the video speak for itself. And by the way, it was in the Pennsylvania State Competition. So very, very exciting for National History Month. Factory would expose that little had really changed. 
It all happened so fast. Doors were locked, furniture trapped workers to the walls. Sprinkler systems were not installed, and the one fire escape collapsed. Firefighters became useless to those on the 8th and 9th floor. Their ladders reached only to the 6th. To the horror of witnesses below, bodies began to fill the streets. And the people had just begun to jump when we got there. Uh, they'd been holding until that time, standing in the windowsills, crowding, uh, being crowded by others behind them. And, and um, the fire pressing closer and closer, the smoke closer and closer. This made a terrible impression on the people of the state of New York. Uh, I, I can't begin to tell you how, how disturbed the people were everywhere. Uh, it was as though we had, we had all done something uh, wrong. After only 30 minutes, 146 immigrant lives were lost. News of the tragic event spread across the country. The deaths were blamed on the two owners of the Triangle Ship which factory. They were originally charged with first and second degree manslaughter, accused of intentionally locking the factory doors. He feared uh, that some of the people in the shop might stroll out through this uh, over, the, over the roof exit with a few shirtwaists rolled up uh, under their jackets, or that somebody might come in uh, and take a few shirtwaists. The owners were ultimately acquitted due to questionable witness testimony. The defense claimed that some were altering their account of the event throughout the trial. But two years later, the owners were found liable of wrongful death in a civil suit. Families of the victims were awarded $75 each. Of the witnesses that day, Frances Perkins knew something more had to change. So she was able to get onto the factory investigation committee? And sometimes what happens in our country, uh, there'll be a disaster, and people will be upset about it for a while, and then it just kind of goes away, forget about it, go back to the life is normal. But she didn't want that to happen, so she went and she made a policy, she go with her and see the factory. As I told you afterwards, seems in some way to have paid the debt that society owed to those children, those young people, who lost their lives in the triangle fire. It's their contribution to the people of New York that we have this really magnificent series of uh, legislative acts to protect and improve the administration of the law regarding the protection of work people in the city of in the state of New York. Between 1911 and 1914, factory investigation commissions recommendations led to 36 new laws, including the use of fireproof receptacles. It is believed the massive fire was sparked when a single cigarette was thrown into a scrap. After the trauma fire, people got involved and they paid attention to what was happening and what was happening to the government, and they pushed for change. The American Society of Safety Professionals, also known as ASSE, formed in 1911 as a direct result of the Triangle Fire and the public's response to it. Its mission is to prevent injuries, illnesses, and fatalities in the workplace. ASSP has 151 local chapters located in 75 countries. There was a time in this country when people went to work and they did whatever dangerous job they had to do in order to make money. They didn't have any choice. Now, when people go to work, they expect work to be safe. It is one of the things that over the past about 100 and few years has really changed about work. In 1971, the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, known as OSHA, was formally established as an agency of the U.S. Department of Labor. The basic premise of what's acceptable in workplaces has changed. At that time, in the early 1900s, workers did not have the rights that they have today. There was very little government regulation and even less enforcement of those regulations. The states started by implementing some regulations. New York City and New York State workers joined unions to uh, allow them to improve their own working conditions. To never allow workers to be in those conditions and found out to cite those employers. So now buildings have to fire escapes, they have to have sprinkler systems in many cases, certainly fire alarms, you know, and, and escape plans. Fire doors and fire exits are now required to open out the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, the doors opened inward, and therefore when people were pushing against them, they were pushing them close. A lot of the women that were survived.
is something that really resonates with people now. And I think you see, you know, people that, you know, immigrant, little young immigrant girls, you know, they have much of a voice. But in this case, they did. And a hundred years later, they're still getting recognized and honored. I think that's pretty amazing. It's really important to have that interest in uh, public service and in, and in protection and to learn from the past. So otherwise, we keep making the same mistakes and the 146 people that died should not have died in vain. And if we can learn from that tragedy and make sure it never happens again, that's something that's really positive. Today, we are left continuously mourning the victim. We also continuously strive for change. We've come a long way in improving worker safety. But how much farther can we get? While the trying to show ways back to file will always remember the worst tragedies in history, it also sparked dramatic change. And every worker today can be thankful for the lessons learned, the awareness created, and the unity of a community to fight for their rights and trial. So I'm going to give you a personal story. So actually, Andrew is right there, but he's a little older now too than he was in that picture. What were you about? Uh, about 12 or so in that picture? Maybe a little older, something like that. that. Yeah, I'm 19. <laughs> <laughs> he always seems like he's 12 to me. You're right, he's 19. <laughs> he's always my baby. Anyway. So this is, this is how it happens. So that is Andrew, who is 19, and uh, that is my husband's grandmother. Her name is Anne. She was actually born two years after Annie Nicholas, who was the victim of the fire, was born. She was named after her. In Jewish religion, you name after people after they're deceased. So that's who she was named after. So just to give you the cast of characters, that is me in the middle there. I was older than 19. And uh, that is my mother-in-law down there, Ellen Wells, and that's my husband and Andrew's dad, Mark Wells. So, Anne is Ellen's mother. Are we getting this so far? And Annie Nicholas was Anne's aunt, who died at 18. That picture, she's probably about uh, 90 or so in that picture, maybe a little older. The reason that this whole thing got started was because Andrew was doing his homework. And he, this, when you were doing your homework, you were about in fifth grade, I think. And um, that's the, the exact history book he was using. So he was doing his homework, and it was about US history, about the Triangle Sherwoods factory. And it just so happened that Anne and Martin, who was, is her, was her husband, they both died at 101 and 102, which I'll talk about. Um, anyway, so uh, he was doing his homework and great Nanny Ann happened to be there and she said, oh, did you know that you have a relative? We didn't really know. And then she eventually whipped out this picture of this beautiful woman, Annie Nicholas, which is her main name. So that's the picture that, uh, that was given. You'll see lots of renditions of that, the same picture in the back, which we'll talk about at the end. Um, 
This picture is of Annie Nicholas H. She must have been, it must have been shortly before she died, because she looks like she's like 16, 17, uh, at least in that picture. So we did learn a few things. We learned that she was the daughter of Samuel and Ray Nicholas from Russia, and she had come when she was a baby, so she was living in the U.S. for 17 years. Her job at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was buttonhole maker, which according to family lore was a very good job. And she also was a union member, which not everybody was at the time, and she died in the fire at age 18. We'll talk more about the circumstances of that. And two years later, that's when Nanny Ann, our Nanny Ann was born. And that's a picture of her at 99, and she did live a little longer. She's a really good looking, good looking woman. Um, we did find from one of her brothers, uh, Ben Nicholas, a, a little excerpt that he had written um, this is actually Ben, circled in red here, and that's Annie circled in there. So um, he wrote that we were living in the Bronx on East 152nd Street near the subway station, and Annie had worked at a seams as a seamstress on a foot-operated sewing machine for the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. I was still in school when on March 25th, that's the, the big day, um, a fire broke out, all doors were locked to keep out visitors and from workers from speaking out. The doors opened inside, thus trapping hundreds of girls behind the locked doors. Bodies were piled high, burnt re beyond recognition. We couldn't find Annie, but Mother's friend found her, and it was the most dreadful blow. Mother never really recovered from it. And he actually says it was $100,075, so who, who knows. A lot of times you'll see the facts are not always very consistent in, in this story. Um, okay. So now just to give you a little history lesson, I'll go faster because I think Dustin's um, video was better than what I have here. So what is a shirtwaist? Shirtwaist basically has that kind of look to it. It was what the modern girl wore at the time. Gibson girls wore that, that style of uh, blouse a lot. They were usually white and very tailored, very similarly to this. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, which is just a few blocks down, I have a little map here, so we are about here. Yeah, no. yeah Washington no. Square no. North. Oh, no. I'm sorry, where's here? No. no. Yes, 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 thank you. I'm all mixed up. So we're about here, and so you can see how close we are right now. If you walk by the building, that's what it looks like now. You'll see there are two plaques. I think Dustin had it on his video also. They're not very noticeable. So they're um, actually, I think they're right here. Yeah. Right here. Okay. Uh, I have that same picture, very, it's a wonderful picture of the two owners. Um, they were called the Shirtwaist Kings. This is a photograph of what it looked like then. Really doesn't look all that much different, really. The outside of the building, um, well, Michael can tell you more about this, but the outside of the building actually did better than the inside of the building from the fire. So it doesn't look all that much different on the outside. This is, I mentioned in the video, that this is a pose picture, but this, uh, this is what it really looked like. Um, just to show you a little map that I had found, if you can see, um, this is of one of the floors, and the, the dotted lines, those long dotted lines, are all the tables. So you can see how close they were. And you know, there was a place to put your coats, a bathroom, a couple of closets. Um, but in the middle, it was machine after machine after machine, and not so easy to get around. And you can see there's scraps on the floor. You see the wicker baskets there, too, and you can see the coats in the background. It, it was uh, crowded and messy and noisy. So what was it like for these people, these women that were working there? Uh, Triangle Shirt Shirtwaist Factory was a typical sweat sweatshop factory. Actually, a lot of people consider themselves pretty lucky to have a job there. Um, it was one of the bigger ones. Uh, they had low wages, long hours, bad working conditions. Who were the women that worked there? Mostly young women immigrants, Jewish, Italian, Irish. Although we did, there are a few other ethnicities there, but it was predominantly this. So you had two choices if you worked there. First, most people were just grateful to have the job. Um, you could just accept the circumstances and just do the best that you can, or you could speak out. Um, and join the labor unions, complain to the police and all that, but it was really a problem. You know, there was a lot of backfire to trying to do something about your situation. So the fire breaks out in 1911. Here you can see like a little cross-section of it on this computer-generated 
drawings. The fire breaks out, spread in just a few minutes. It happened really, really fast. Um, some of the hazards. Supposedly that when the doors was locked to the stairway, the fire escape, which Dustin talked about in the video, uh, collapsed. The cluttered workspaces had wicker baskets and, and scraps of fa fabric all around. The ladders weren't tall enough. The floors had some oil on it, which only helped the fire spread more. The uh, fire nets that they had at the bottom weren't strong enough to capture the people that were. They went right through, through them, which is awful. Um, no sprinkle systems, they just had pails of water and those wicker baskets and other things were obstacles. It was, you just couldn't move in these, in these rooms. And um, as you can see, they, look how helpless the policeman is. He's just watching the people jump out the window, for example. And uh, there you've got um, when they all were being uh, identified, the young women. Um, these are just some of the names of some of the, um, some of the victims. You'll see, different, again, different ethnicities, uh, a lot of sisters, some people were engaged. Everybody seems to have known each other at, at, this, um, at this company. So here's a few, um, I'll just read a few of them. Um, stories. We heard, I heard a lot about Joe Zito. Joe Zito was the elevator operator, and supposedly he was a real hero, because people were so crazy, you know, that this, this whole thing happened so fast, when they couldn't get enough people in the elevators, people were jumping on top of the elevator. So um, it was just a no-win situation. Um, let's see, just looking quickly at some of them, um, this one talks about, the one in the blue, talks about a group of men that made a human ladder outside when they saw what was going on. And they, they tried to reach these, um, these young screaming women, but they couldn't reach them. The ladders weren't high enough either. Um, here you see people were just jumping out the window. This, this particular one it make, is very sad, where it said basically the one in the purple says that um, um, a man held the woman out the window and just tried to, he had no choice, he let her go, and he felt like he did the right thing for her, and then he committed suicide himself because they were just trying to avoid the fire. Okay, so you have all of the uh, newspaper articles about it, all the controversy, all the, um, all the stories about the barred doors, about the, uh, the, the lack of safety and all of that about the owners. Um, there were a lot of political cartoons at the time. To me, um, this one really, well, they actually, they both say it all. They're both very poignant political cartoons. You could see the, the, the stress that everybody was going through at the time. I, I really do compare the way that people reacted to this tragedy is not so different than the way people reacted to 9-11. It just brought out those kinds of emotions. It, that galvanized people because they just couldn't believe how horrible this had ha tragedy had happened to so many innocent people. Um, they um, they did have a trial, and this is uh, one of the girls that were was one of the employees. She said she swore the doors were locked. They're they're uh, questioning all the employees, but all in all, they did get acquitted. And it was so controversial that they had to smuggle the jurors out the back door because everybody was so crazed about the entire uh, thing of it. So just going back to the personal story, so this is how I got involved. So we know that Andrew started out reading the history book, but then um, I decided to take it one step further and I found out that Cornell University has the, um, the Industrial Labor Relations School in Ithaca and um, they have a uh, their archives there, they have digital archives. Feel free to look it up, it's fascinating. It's a really a good website. So when I called them, I said to them, let's go back. I, I said to them, I have this wonderful picture of Annie Nicholas, would you like it? Within three seconds, she said, yes I do, I scanned it, I sent it, and now they had a record of her. They really didn't have any documentation on her, so having this picture was a real, Coup. So when I spoke to the woman there, she said, I want to introduce you to Michael Hirsch. And Michael Hirsch is the, um, the producer of uh, the HBO special, Trying and Remembering the Fire, which you can watch. So now here's where the story gets really, really interesting. The story of the scissors. So what happened was, you know, Mark's, um, 
my husband's grandmother, uh, Anne, she had a story that she told us when she showed us the picture, and the story was the story of the scissors. So what the story was, was that Annie realized that there was a fire, she ran out, then she realized she forgot her scissors. So she ran back in. And when she ran back in, she did, did not survive. And that was the story that she wanted to go back and get her scissors because it was her livelihood and she did the right thing and tragedy struck. So when I called Michael Hirsch, which I was instructed to do, I leave this message saying who I am. And he called me, it must have been at least 10 o'clock at night, and he was literally crying. And I didn't know this man, and I didn't understand why he was crying. But he told me the reason that he was so shut up is because every year, he had been researching this for about 10 years, he said every year he takes a group of family members that he has met over all his research, and he takes them to different cemeteries because some of them are buried as, as a group. So the, the Jewish cemetery, which is where she was buried, he was just there that day. So when he came home and heard the message, he said he didn't have his pizza, he just called me right away. So what happened was that he said that every year he goes past Annie Nicholas's uh, tomb. So this is the cemetery, by the way, where he was. He goes by her, her, um, her, her tombstone and puts some, you know, little pebbles on it, which is traditional. And he said no one ever did that. We didn't even know she was buried there. We didn't know anything. So he said every year he felt bad that nobody ever commemorated her. So he'd been doing that for 10 years, and he had done it that evening. All right. So now, so he, so he tells me all this, and he said, "Wow, that's amazing." And I, so I said to him, "I'm so nice to meet you, and I'm, I'm going to send you the picture and all of that." And he said, "I, I said before we hang up, I want to tell you the story of the scissors." And I told him the story, and he said, "That can't be." He said, it's impossible, she couldn't have gone back, she was just a girl, and you know, with all the chaos going on and all the frenzy, how could she have pushed her way back into a building when the fire happened so fast? And Michael will talk more about the logistics of all that, but Michael first said that couldn't possibly have happened. He said what he learned from all his research was that this was so, such a tragic and emotional event was that he, uh, learned that a lot of parents told their little, the other children, the, the, the siblings, that don't, you know, don't feel so bad, they did something good, they went back mm -hmm. to get the scissors. Mm -hmm. They went, he had actually never heard a story of the scissors before, he went, heard more stories, like they went back to get their sister, they went back to get the fiance, they went back to get whatever. He said that was just something they told the children so they wouldn't be so, scared and not find out that actually we found out later that she was one of the people that jumped out the window. But we didn't know all that. So I called um, Mark's grandmother, Anne, and said, before you speak to him, I want to tell you, don't be upset, but he was basically saying that he didn't think your family story was correct. And in true Nanny Anne fashion, which I think Andrew would agree. She said, well, maybe that was true about everybody else's parents. But, and, and she was about, what, 95 or something when she said it. She said, but my parents would never have lied to me, so it can't be true. But eventually she realized that maybe it was true. So anyway, we did find out that Annie Nicholas, she's right here, 18, see it says jump burns on body. We actually, my, uh, Michael Hirsch actually did find the death certificate for me, so it, that was accurate. She was one of the East Harlem 10. She was one of the few people that didn't live on the Lower East Side. She actually lived on, um, in the East Harlem area. And actually, you'll see in the back, um, I have like a little lacquered picture on, on a yellowish um, tile. And in East Harlem, they actually, an artist did a, uh, a public arts project in which she shows that picture in the park. So anyway, so just finishing up here, we have lots of ceremonies. This is the parade that they do with the shirtwaist. Oh, Michael Bloomberg. Um, we had a lot of dignitaries, Chuck Schumer also, who were at the 100th anniversary. This is my other son, who was interviewed by the uh, NYU newspaper. My mother-in-law was um, interviewed by China um, journalists, Chinese journalists. 
And now you can do other things. They have a chalk project um, where they go in front of the buildings that these people lived and you can commemorate them there. Uh, here's some more examples. You can, they have quilts. And you will learn more about Jennifer Mertz with her illustrated book, Plays, with Lulu, Lulu um, Lolo, which she does these reenactments. Books, tons of books that you can read on the Triangle Shirtways Factory. Some fictional, some non-fiction, or a big variety. Um, one year they actually let the um, family members into the building to see the floors that, that this actually happened. And now, believe it or not, is a chemistry lab for NYU. So these are some pictures there. You can see the ladder going up. Uh, this is what it looks like now. So that's the staircase renovated a little bit, but you get the idea. And this is view out the window. And when we looked out the window, it was really very, very strange to be standing there. And when you look out the window, you can see how they actually probably thought if they jumped, they'd be okay. Because you really, it, it didn't seem that bad when you were up there. And then I had a picture of fire alarm, which seemed very appropriate. Um, I'm going to let Richard talk more about the, um, about the memorial that they're building. So I'll just skip this part. But I just wanted to um, talk to a little, just one more thing about Anne and Annie. And she lived to 101. She died at 18. You know, now know her story. But uh, Anne's story, she lived a long life, really never worked a day in her life, had grandchildren, children, great grandchildren, um, really fabulous. She had a fabulous life. And I wonder what they each would have thought of each other's lives a hundred, you know, around a hundred years later. So I just wanted to end it with that personal note. And then I think we're ready for the next more technical rendition with Michael. Michael is the uh, Associate Principal of the Fire Protection and, Safe and Life Safety at WJE, and he has all this, he's more of a technical person, so you'll learn more about, about what he does. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll just stand over here, it's fine. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, actually, you know what, why don't we stay here for a second. I, I don't talk about, I'm an engineer, so uh, I design fire protection and life safety systems for buildings, that's, that's what I do. I generally don't talk about building fire safety or exiting. Uh, that's usually not my, that's not, usually not my stick, but I guess uh, one of the things that came to mind as I started preparing for this a little bit today uh, was how we, how we just take things for granted in our everyday lives and we don't think about things anymore. Um, the coronavirus, you know, I'm sitting at home the other day and, and the Vice President of the United States gets on TV and has to tell us to wash our hands after we use the bathroom. We should be kind of past that, right? <laughs> we should be past that. But apparently we're not because the flu every year spreads. The coronavirus is spreading now and we have the capabilities to, to take care of ourselves for certain things. We just neglect to do it. Seatbelts, same thing. Helmets on uh, motorcycles. So I guess my, my little soapbox speech that I'm trying to get across to you now is a lot of us, when the fire alarm goes off and we're sitting in our office mm. or in our hotel and it's 2 a.m. and we know it's a false alarm. And it's February. Right? I don't want to get up and go down the stairs. Just, just do it. Just do it. Um, you'll feel good about yourself. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe you'll feel a little angry with me when you find out it was a false alarm. But I would ask you to do it because one thing that we forget is how fast a fire can really grow in a building. Um, and so that, that's my little soapbox. But, but please, at least think about it when the fire alarm goes off. At least think about it. Even when the fire drills, be the first person to the door. It's not that hard. Um, so in looking at this and doing some of the research, one thing I found out was a lot of the accounts uh, that you read in a number of books are different. Different enough where I stopped trusting them. And I said, well, look, I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and do my own research to see if I can find out 
how this building was supposed to be constructed back when it was built. Um, so that's what I'm talking about uh, at the outset. And, and we'll go through what I found. And I, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, we'll talk about whether or not the building was code compliant. Uh, I'll go through a little bit faster. Um, some prior factory survey findings um, and, and, uh, and some of the conclusions I reached. The building was constructed between 1900 and 1901. Um, and the 1901 building code of New York City applied which I happened to be able to get a copy of, uh, thankfully. And I was able to find a number of interesting things. So there's a lot of accounts which are all, all accurate that the building was designed to be fireproof. But what does fireproof mean? So fireproof, um, as a fire protection engineer, when we talk about buildings nowadays, I, we don't refer to buildings as fireproof. Fireproof implies that nothing can go wrong. It, it's impervious to fire. Well, nothing's impervious to fire. So we don't even use that term anymore. But what fireproof meant back then was made of stuff that doesn't burn, <coughs> um, which, which isn't, uh, isn't all that descriptive about how it will perform in an actual fire. Doing a little bit more research, I found out that no sprinklers were required in the building. They weren't required in New York City until 1937, which is very surprising after a tragedy like this, that sprinklers weren't required to these buildings until 1937. No fire alarm system, again, not required. Fire extinguishers, not required. Fire buckets, I don't know whether they were required or not. They were there. There's photo evidence that they were there. Um, there's also uh, documented evidence from uh, people involved in the fire that they were there. Whether they were, were required or not, I didn't find anything in the code that indicated they were required. What's interesting, so this is a, a a photograph, obviously, I'm not my door, uh, about the fire buckets um, have the round bottom. Does anybody know why they have the round bottom? A very practical reason. So they don't get stolen. <laughs> right? Otherwise, it's a perfectly good bucket. <laughs> and nobody's using it, so I'll take it home. Uh, so they don't get stolen. Now, as it turns out, the ones at the, at the triangle shirt base have the flat bottoms. How about stairs? The building had two stairs. The building was, was actually required to have three because of the square footage. However, however, the Department of Buildings and the Building Commissioner had the authority to grant variances, and that's still true to this day. Uh, building departments can have the have the right to have a little bit of flexibility. And there is uh, there's reports that the architect um, negotiated to have the fire escape that was in the back of the building count as the third stair. Um, they had the ability to do that. So technically, if that was approved by the building department, it complied with code. Now let's talk about the fire escapes for a second. Were fire escapes required for the building? Kind of. Kind of. If you read the language, shall be provided with such good and sufficient fire escape, stairways, and other means of egress in case of fire, as shall be directed by the Department of Buildings. So is that a requirement? I don't know. Not really. Um, and then the other thing is the fire escape uh, was reported to have led to a second story skylight. That's been pretty consistent uh, throughout everything I've read. And there's a picture of the actual fire escape after it collapsed. And the other thing that you can see here is that fire escape is only 17 and a half inches wide. 17 and a half inches is a pretty narrow stick. That is, that's one person walking down the back. I just have to give you an idea. And if you also look at the doors, the doors open onto that narrow, that narrow stair. So it's, it's uh, very difficult to, to use that fire escape. Uh, I like this picture for a couple of reasons. First, my you can see the fire buckets right up against the wall. You see them there, you see a fire bucket, and that's probably a, a, a hook for a coat. And then down the line, you see more fire buckets. Um, I think this photograph was taken on the, uh, on the eighth floor. Um, pretty sure this was the eighth floor. But you see the sign for the fire escape. And the reason I say that is the photographs that I typically see about the, uh, 
uh, about, about the layout happen to be, and Debbie, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they typically tend to be the eighth floor. Yeah, I, I think that's the case, so I was just thinking about that today, thank you. Um, so, uh, door swing. <clears throat> Were the doors, you know, what about the doors? Were the doors required to swing in the direction of the exit egress? Well, yes, unless it was, wasn't practical, and then they don't have to. Um, so they weren't really required to swing in the direction of egress. Now they have to swing in the direction of egress. It doesn't matter. You make it practical because they got to swing in the direction of egress. So was the building compliant? Well, back in the day, Albert Ludwig of the New York City Department of Buildings said this building could have been worse and it would have come within the requirements of the law. And unfortunately, the conclusion that I reach is he was right. This building complied with the building code. In fact, in fact, how about this for a shot? In fact, this building exceeded the building code in some respects because it had a standpipe system in it and it wasn't required to. Now, the standpipe wasn't very effective. It wasn't really designed well. Um, it was, in fact, it was very ineffective. Um, but it actually, to a certain degree, exceeded the code. Not surprising. Now, prior to the primary height. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I forget. I'm an engineer. So a stamp pipe is the fire hoses that the uh, that the occupants typically are used for fire department personnel now uh, use to uh, to put out the fire by hand. So it's basically fire hoses connected to a, a big. Uh, now would be a four-inch pipe. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Appreciate that. Going back to common sense, um, prior to the fire, and Debbie knows about this because I've seen her speak on this before, prior to the fire, immediately prior, prior to the fire, there was a group that went through and surveyed a number of factories in New York City. And they came up with a list of, uh, I won't call them violations, but fire safety issues that they wanted to talk about. And they had significant concerns about. These are all common sense issues to us now. But none of them were code requirements, virtually none of them were code requirements at the time. It's very surprising. Um, doors locked during working hours, that, apl that applied to the, uh, the triangle fire, maybe. There was different, you know, there was a lot of different uh, comments about whether or not that was the case or not. For housekeeping, certainly. Um, combustible partitions, yeah, that's a problem. Um, but that was really interesting. <clears throat> so really quickly, I'm at, uh, coming up from my time uh, quicker, quickly than more quickly than I could, I'm just yanking off on this time. So other building, uh, building issues, talk about the high occupant load. So what's a high occupant load? Now I do this for a living, so I do this all the time, but a lot of people just like, it looks crowded, that looks like a lot of people. But just to put it in perspective, when we design a building, if somebody's designing a new building, everything is based on occupant load factor. So how many square feet per person, you know, on that, in, that, uh, in that type of a building? So an office building, which is business, that's a, about 100 square feet per person. <coughs> Actually, that recently got revised down to 50 square feet, feet per person because there's a lot more cubes in office buildings now than there used to be right? <coughs> private offices. Factory's about 100 square feet per person. Courtrooms are a little bit more dense at 40 square feet per person, but tells me you get the idea. So what I did with the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire is I took an, an approximate number, and like I said, the occupant load on the day of the fire, it's all over the place depending on what you read, but I picked 275, it seemed to be right around with a, a lot of the uh, documents I read said. I said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna back that out for 10,000 square foot space and figure out what the occupant load factor would have been, just to get an idea of how crowded it was. And it came out to 36.3 square feet per person, which if you look up the list, that's similar to a courtroom. And that's a factory use, if you think about it. So the occupant load on those floors were pretty dense, pretty dense. And if you, you know, do some reading, the actual number of those, uh, of the, of the uh, of workers on the floor, on a typical weekday, one of the documents I saw was 900 people. And that's down to 11.1. So that's like now, that's like this, but 10,000 square feet of this with, with only a couple exits. So it just gives you an idea of what, what, uh, what we're talking about with high occupant load. Building stairs, I actually like Debbie's picture better than mine because it's recent, but you, you can't change the width of those stairs unless you rip them out and, and create a whole new shaft. So they may do with the existing stair that they have, which are allowed to do. Um, 
But how wide is how wide is an exit stair? Um, when you go back and look at the code back in 1901, they just said you need two stairs. There was no mention of how wide they need to be. No mention at all. Just the width, I don't know, the width of a normal stair. Right? 33 inches, I guess. That was the width of a normal stair back then. Um, now, nowadays, when we, when, well, first of all, we're required that our, all of our stairs for Nicolay are required to be at least 44 inches. And we also then have to go back and calculate, well, how many people are going to be at that floor if 44 inches doesn't take care of it? There's a way we can figure out that we need more stairs. So that's how we deal with it now. But just to give you an idea, um, the stairs at the time could have handled, the two stairs could have handled 330 people. Two stairs in a modern building can handle 440 people. So it's a, it's a pretty big difference. Pretty big difference. So um, as a result of the fire, there, there and uh, I think Dustin's uh, video did a great job setting this up for this. Uh, there was a lot of code change, a lot of progress, which was a wonderful thing. Um, the National Fire Protection Association existed back then, but back then the focus was on property protection. It was more kind of for the insurance industry, more so. They were focused on protecting the buildings, not the people. Now, among their internal discussions, they knew that there was a problem with life safety in these buildings, but they, it just wasn't their purview, they never addressed it. In fact, one of the things they talked about a lot was fire escapes. Like, fire escapes? Really? Fire escapes? Come on, we need stairs. But it wasn't in their purview, they never addressed it. But as a result of this fire, they formed some special committees, and over time, uh, in 1913, they formed the, the Committee of, the, of uh, Safety for Life Committee, which is, became the Life Safety Code in 1927, which is now the basis for uh, egress in most of the building codes, or at least it was for a long time before some other folks were developed. And uh, just to start winding this up a little bit, if you just look at number of pages, which is probably not the right way to look at it, I couldn't figure out any other way to look at it. I mean, I know some stuff, but you know, it's kind of boring. Um, but if you just look at number of pages, I think it illustrates how far we've come. 1899 to 1901, the code was 148 pages. Then there's a little decrease. I don't know why that was. Maybe a smaller type. Maybe they had, you know, uh, wider margins. I don't know. Um, but then, 1938, the building code started looking more like a, a building code that, that we use today. I mean, we build, we construct the building now. Um, 1968, which was the last standalone edition of the New York City building code, was a little over a thousand pages. And now, New York City has adopted a version of the uh, International Building Code which is 679 pages, but it's got a lot of reference standards in there too. And like I said, you can't really go by volume. More isn't always necessarily better. But I can tell you that uh, all of these codes tell you the details of how to install a sprinkler system so it actually works, how wide stairs need to be, uh, how long is too far away from an exit, um, what's an unsafe uh, arrangement for exit locations and things of that nature. And all those things add up over time to improve, uh, to improve life safety. And I think my time is up for <laughs> that. Thank you. Of explaining all these technical things that you know we, we, we are looking at it from our our time period looking at it, but when you do your research, you're really showing what was in code at the time and what they were thinking at the time. So it gives you a di very different perspective. And that's, to me, that's what this whole panel tonight was about, is to give you a different perspective, not just a history lesson. So going from a very technical um, rendition, now we're going to go way the other side to the creative interpretations of the Triangle Factory. And Jennifer is going to talk about her artwork, which, by the way, everything on your way out Please feel free to take all the literature, um, look at all the pictures that we have, and I think you'll really enjoy everything in the back on, on your way out when you're ready to leave. But in the meantime, we're going to let Jennifer okay. tell her creative process. 
So much, Debbie. Uh, really good to be here tonight. Um, I'm pit pitch hitting for an artist who couldn't make it tonight, and so I'm especially happy to be here. As Debbie said, I'm an artist, I'm a writer, particularly of children's picture books, um, and uh, you'll see some of my things in the back, and I do want you to please take a look. Uh, there's one piece that is an original, and I'm going to go through my process and some things that are prints, and then you'll also see some cards, and um, please take a card, and um, um, you know, email me if you like, um, and uh, I've got a mailing list there, if you'd like to join my mailing list, because I have a new book coming out that I'd like to talk to you about also, that is centered around the fire, and it is called Steadfast, the story of Francis Perkins, champion of workers' rights. So I'm going to try to tie together some of these, all of these wonderful presentations, and I'm especially grateful for Dustin to give his um, talk and video because he introduced you to Frances Perkins if you didn't already know of her and uh, how important she is, uh, especially now. Here we are um, in Women's History Month and, uh, and and whatnot. So let me start by reading, if you'll indulge me please, the reading um, a piece that I wrote that does give an overview of um, where Francis fits into all of this, okay? At the beginning of the 20th century, over 5,000 immigrants came to America daily, arriving through Ellis Island from Russia, Italy, and Eastern Europe. Most were Jewish or Italian looking to escape religious persecution and financial hardship. Their hopes of a better life were dashed when they found themselves trapped in abject poverty. The immigrants lived in dingy, airless tenement apartments with as many as 2,500 people in one city block. Freezing in winter and sweltering in summer, tenements had one toilet for 20 people and no place to bathe. Children as young as six were employed in factories or sweatshops up to 12 hours a day, six days a week. There were no laws to protect minors and school was considered a luxury. Immigrant girls and young women, many of whom didn't speak English, made up much of the workforce. Workers seldom quit out of desperate need. These were the wretched circumstances that youthful and compassionate Francis Perkins encountered when investigating labor conditions for the National Consumers League of New York City. These conditions also provided the backdrop for the tragic Triangle Fire. Of the 146 people who perished in the fire on March 25, 1911, most were girls or young women, ages 13 to 23, Jewish or Italian immigrants. The Triangle Fire set the wheels in motion for radical workplace reform, energizing the labor movement, and galvanizing a young Frances Perkins to devote her life to social betterment. Prior to the fire, the government assumed it had no power to regulate business. As attitudes shifted, laws were passed to protect the American worker. Frances was there doggedly pressing for major reforms every step of the way. Committed to social justice at a time when it was unacceptable for women to speak up or have careers, Frances was a bold advocate for the American laborer. Her courageous achievements culminated in her accomplishments as Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Secretary of Labor. As the first woman in a presidential cabinet, she was the force behind the New Deal, the sweeping social programs signed into law by FDR during the Great Depression. Frances Perkins would later say that the New Deal was born on March 25th, 1911, at the Triangle. So we have a tremendous correlation between what happened and this tragedy, and not only the safety reforms that Frances and her teams pushed for, 
but moving forward, her determination to um, m make um, the world a better place for the worker. And uh, her ideas were um, a 40 hour work week, uh, minimum wage, uh, workman's compensation, uh, insurance, things like that. And um, um, FDR said, yes, 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 you can, you can do it. So um, she's really, although he rolled out the program, she's the architect behind it. And I found that quite fascinating. So what I'd like to do is to show you kind of how my journey has been um, creatively. I started with the uh, shirt waist piece that you'll see in the back when I was an MFA student at FIT just a few blocks over. Um, I got my master's of fine arts there in 2014. So I happened to be a student there when it was um, 2011, 100 years um, anniversary of the fire. What? And um, on this 100th anniversary, uh, we as students there in this MFA program were required to do uh, a, a piece of work that um, spoke to us you know, in terms of the fire. So we did some research and um, I decided to, to make it be about the uh, shirt waist itself. It could have been anything, about the building, anything. But I decided to do the shirt waist. Um, I started the way I start many sketches with brown paper because I, I am a collage artist, so I like to think in form as opposed to line, although I can get into line work also. So I start with um, brown paper bags from the supermarket and rip the shape that I need for whatever picture that I am doing. And I was playing here with backgrounds and the shape of the blouse itself. Uh, here I was playing with a very kind of a graphic image. Um, and my work is all handcrafted and done uh, traditionally. So this was all paper and paste. and scissors and glue and things like that. Um, this is further down the line with the process of making this shirt waist. And you'll see that in the front of it, I've created this kind of a texture um, that shows the uh, pin tucking of the blouse itself. And in that, what I did was I put um, a very moving poem uh, and it is by Carl Sandberg, and it's called Mill Doors. Um, this is just kind of some close-ups. It's Mill Doors, you never come back. I say goodbye when I see you going in the doors, the hopeless open doors that call and wait and take you then for how many cents a day? How many cents for the sleepy eyes and fingers? I say goodbye because I know they tap your wrists in the dark, in the silence, day by day, and all the blood of you drop by drop, and you are old before you are young. You never come back. And I just was so touched by this poem that I knew I needed to put it within the artwork. So I printed it up, you'll see it in the back, um, and, and did that as the pin tucking. Then moving along to this, I was thinking about what I would do in the background, and so these are um, individually hand-cut shirt waists, uh, done without any kind of drawing or pattern, um, because I wanted each one to be individual. There's 146 of them in the picture, one for each victim. So I had to lay it out very carefully to make sure that they all fit and that there was no extra space and it looked good design-wise and color-wise. So this gives you kind of an idea for that part of the picture. And at, at this stage of the game, I'm just laying it all out and putting things together. Um, then, of course, I needed to think about what, what's going to be behind everything. This was oil painting, and I, I, I thought, well, maybe something to do with flames and things like that. This didn't work, so <laughs> out it went. Instead, I decided to go very dark. Uh, and that would show off the shirt waist and those little teeny shirts, too. And I incorporate, um, very often in my work, I incorporate laces, buttons, trims, and 
Um, I don't sew, but I like glue. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the actual piece, uh, a photo of it that you'll see in the back. Um, uh, and what I decided to do as um, uh, my book kind of morphed. Debbie showed a slide of my book from before. Mm -hmm. My book has morphed from the fire uh, on its own, that, that, was, that was a different stage, to this particular book that I'm working on now that will come out this year on the life of Frances Perkins. So uh, because the fire was so integral to why she was um, galvanized to make the social changes that she did, um, I'm using this particular piece as the page one, the, 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 um, the title page of the book. Not the cover, but the, the title page. And now you'll see some of my work that you will see in the finished book. And this is a sneak preview, because no one but my husband has seen these so far. So, <laughs> so this picture is of Francis, it's all collage, except for the details of her face um, that I painted in gouache. Um, and this is when she is in college and she goes to a factory for the very first time. Because she was, she was born into a few kind of upper middle class situation in um, um, Massachusetts. And um, she was really not aware of, of, of what was going on. So, okay, we're just about at the end. Okay. So this is another picture that is in the book. And here we have the uh, immigrants and the uh, tenements. And this is a picture of Frances in the middle as she protests and she's finding her way uh, to figure out what she wants to do prior to the fire. Uh, here's a picture you'll recognize of the ash building itself done all in collage, um, nothing computer generated. Um, and my picture of the workers as they were in the factory. Um, and this is the kind of perfect storm that we talked about before, the doors that were locked and didn't open out, the broken uh, fire escape, the broken elevator, the ladders that were too short and some did make it out over the roof but it was quite a climb on a ladder to get to the other NYU building. Um, here we have later Frances working in a room with men because she was uh, the only woman in in the government room and here she is in Washington doing her work. So that is it. Thank you, Chris. And I definitely encourage you to all look at the uh, the illustrations in the back. They're they're really she does a fantastic job. We have all sorts of things we're going to look at in the back. Um, we're going to end this with uh, with a talk by Richard Yu, who is who worked on the design of the um, the memorial that's being built on the actual site of the building. So it's a very, very interesting story. So we're going to listen to that, and then we'll have a short Q&A at the end, and then we'll let you go. So <laughs> let me uh, give this microphone to Richard. He'll tell you the whole story. I'd like to sit down. Hi, guys. Hello. Um, my name is Richard. I am co-designer of the memorial. Uh, we are building this thing, uh, hopefully in the next year. Um, it's commissioned by the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. Uh, my co-designer, Uri Wegman, is not here. He's in Brussels. Um, the architect of record is Charles Foster, and the project manager is Peter Homestead. And that's just a short slice of the gigantic uh, uh, team of people who are putting this memorials together and have been fighting for this for a long time. So, um, Triangle Fire Memorial. All right, so the site today is marked with bronze plaques, but beyond that remains anonymous to thousands of students and residents and 
visitors, just a block from Washington Square Park, as you know. In 2013, there was an international and anonymous design competition hosted by the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition for the permanent memorial to the Triangle Fire. It is to be built on the face of the building where the fire occurred, a block from Washington Square Park. Our entry was driven with the desire to maximize the emotional experience of remembering utilizing a minimum of material. With our winning entry, textured stainless steel ribbons descend from the corner of the ninth floor where the fire did its most harm. As it descends to the ground, it splits horizontally along the building facades where the names of the 146 victims are cut into it. The ribbon then caps the sides of the memorial and ends at the darkened reflective panel on the street level. The face of the, face of the reflective panel is etched with a single line of text near the lower edge, telling testimonies of survivors and eyewitnesses of the fire as visitors transverse the length of the memorial. The names of the victims overhead appear in the reflective panel. Reading the names of the victims as reflections in the sky is an essential part of the design. Inviting the passerby to pause from the familiar in the mundane and to enter a space of literal and emotional reflection. It is here between the reflective panel and the names of the victims that the visitor of the memorial encounters themselves. The pedestrian looking downward to the reflective panel, then looking upward towards the trajectory of the ribbon is part of the innate language of New York and echoes the witnessing of the fire itself. Looking up, looking down. Part of the potency of the Triangle Fire is the sheer expanse of time between the memorial as monument and the event it remembers. Over 100 years at this point, before it stands, the anxiety amongst those who champion the fire is that people will slowly forget to remember it all. You see it in the name, Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. The fear is that the thread of history may lose its continuity due to ambivalence. But what I have found in this community surrounding the Triangle Fire is not ambivalence or helplessness, but focus and persistence. The design became more enriched each time someone pushed against it as did the will and determination of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. Those who lived across from where the fire occurred thought the memorial would light up like a disco ball. We took their concerns seriously and searched for a better material and found we could reduce the sun glare by using stone glass, a stunning material that appropriately comes from Italy. We studied it on site during the course of the evening to discover that no additional lighting was needed. As a transition to night, it was more compelling without. The basic scheme that won the design competition evolved. The memorial is made from two types of materials, stone glass and uh, black stone glass for the reflective panel and steel for the ribbon. We looked at casting and acid etching as a way to transform the metal. We initially thought we could give the metal a generic texture, but we were unsatisfied with that. We could, what could we do to endow the material with meaning that reverberates from the past to the present moment? How could we engage the public? During this time, while we worked on refining the design, we were astonished to the extent to which the long, deep, worn, and tattered threads of the Triangle Fire's history were intertwined in the thick fabric of New York City and its people, young and old. We met many devoted to the memorialization of the Triangle Fire, historians, activists, artists, writers, labor union members, and descendants of victims and survivors, stories that had been passed down for generations. We talked to descendants who carry with them this distant and heavy memory. These encounters, these stories, help us understand that the memorial should be born from those who it serves, that it should be a memorial for the public, from the public. We became increasingly more committed to engaging the public 
and the building of the Triangle Fire Memorial. Our gathering at FIT on March 16, 2019, to create a collective ribbon was born from this commitment. The Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition invited people to become, through their contribution and work, part of the Triangle Fire Memorial. For two days, the community gathered at FIT to create a huge ribbon by sewing together smaller individual pieces of fabric donated by the participants. The ribbon would be used to cast the main component of the memorial, which will then be mounted on the side of the brown plate. We would archive everything. Mail-ins were encouraged from those who could not make the date or work from abroad. Looking across the Great Hall at FIT, I realized that laying out hundreds of feet of canvas on these tables in four long rows was the very first step in the fabrication of the Triangle Fire Memorial. We were breaking ground for the memorial in that very instant, when needle and thread penetrated memory and purpose. It was an unusual, the perfectly fitting groundbreaking, rows and rows of hands and thread and fabric, and the projection of personal memory on this now very public document, the ribbon, and soon the Triangle Fire Memorial itself. Personal stories were told. Readings of Triangle-inspired work were read. Every fragment of fabric of memory was archived. There was an excerpt of Fire in My Mouth performed by a quartet from the New York Philharmonic, and 40 from the Young Persons Chorus in New York City, and afterwards a Q&A with Julia Wolf, the Pulitzer-winning composer of Fire in My Mouth. The sound was different from the factory in 1911. The purpose of our communal work was one the 146 victims could not have imagined. It was a tribute not just to their work in life, but to the activism and change their death inspired. Over 100 years ago, and continues to inspire today, in this very moment at these tables. Nests of needles and swarms of thread were strewn across four long rows of tables that are crammed with hand sewing. Fabric scraps are cut and trimmed and fitted. The rooms filled with rustles, filled, the room fills and rustles with energy. The energy of people who have come to sew a 300 foot long ribbon. They sew pieces of fabric from their lives or from scrap we give them if they show up at the end. Some come alone to sew a single fragment of fabric into the ribbon and leave. Others stay to help sew. People trim pieces of fabric to fit the spot they have chosen on the ribbon and take them to another table where each piece of fabric is photographed and their written stories archived. The tables, each 66 feet long, recede into what eerily resembles the horizon of a sweatshop floor. Along its length, the collective ribbon thickens with fragments of cloth and artifacts that people have treasured for years or made anew, and will now have a life in the fabric of the memory of the Triangle Farm Memorial. Here and there, I touch the fragments that people had sewn into the ribbon. The act of remembering reframes the memory reconstructing it with each recollection. Similarly, our relationship with a vessel of memory held in the hand, or a vessel of memory built tall on the schist of Manhattan, changes each time we encounter it. The Triangle Fire Memorial is designed to hinge on this fulcrum, pivoting between present and past, and tilting into the future. Um, in remembering the Triangle Fire, we reframe our relationship to that which the fire brought to the forefront over 100 years ago. We also reframe our relationship to our own present, and yet, as a thing in the world, the memorial is barely there. The memory, the material of the memorial is light, absent space and memory. It works as a catalyst. The Triangle Fire Memorial was designed in keeping with this ethic towards material and history. Its presence on the urban landscape is but a sliver of sky. 
than cuts into the chunks of Manhattan. But what it does is potent. In remembering, we reframe ourselves. And these are uh, individual fragments before they got sewn into the ribbon. And you get to see uh, family descendants, fragments and stories from professors, and this string of childlike embroidery, which I think is gorgeous and never noticed. There's union groups representing <coughs> a great grand use of a fire victim, entire shirt weights, underwear, maps, my mom's mother's scarf, there's hair, joy tornado, over 400 participants wrote their stories, sewn in something, anything, that they may project some meaning onto. This archive will be maintained at the Gill Center Cornell University in perpetuity, and the stories are being transcribed digitally, so spreadsheet, to be cross-referenced with a fragment of fabric and the location on the ribbon and the eventual location on the memorial itself. So this is uh, down below ribbon A, and up above it is the file that we give the acid etcher uh, the next month or so. So the collective ribbon created from this patchwork will be etched into metal of 320 feet. It will become the texture on the stainless steel panels of the Triangle Fire Memorial. Thank you. Yeah. That is really touching. Isn't that going to be a really, really nice memorial? Anyway, okay, so now we have just about maybe five or ten minutes for questions and answers. And we have an illustrious uh, selection of people to ask. Does anybody have any questions? You do, yes. Um, I hope I can be heard. I live in the Uniqlo building between, uh, on Broadway between Prince and Spring. On May 5th, 1911, so less than two months after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, the women who had been working on my floor, very similar young immigrant women, saw smoke rising out the Crosby Street window. They panicked and rushed towards the uh, stairwell. The balustrade broke, they crashed to the uh, floor. Below, floors below, two of them died and uh, hundreds were injured. And it was the following month that the uh, Fire in Investigation Committee was set up by the state in that June. And that not only was uh, mentioned in their report, but also it, one of the reasons they thought that maybe fire alarms were not a good idea was because of the, the way that the women panicked and that fire alarms might cause a panic that would cause the stairs to collapse in the way they did in my building. Um, I'm, I, I think I'm remembering that right. The other thing I wanted to mention is I'm the archivist here at Judson and I so appreciate your, our history. I, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned it. I just wanted to let you know that our building is not open all the time, but if you want to see our Lafarge windows, come anytime at 1030 during our regular services. Uh, you don't have to stay. You can just come look at the glass or every Wednesday night we have arts programming. So when the sun is with daylight savings, when it gets uh, a little more sun in there, you want to come when the sun is shining because we had open house, uh, open house New York on a very rainy day and you really couldn't see the glass. Or just come see me and I'll find a time that you can see the glass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This site is an important part of history too. Yes? I worked with a woman whose mother worked at the Triangle Fire at the Shirt Police Company but she left two weeks before the fire because she felt conditions, when working conditions were horrible, she, she went somewhere else. She lives on the Lower East Side. Wow. So uh, she always spent, oh, my, my co-worker told me she was grateful the rest of her life because she might have been one of the victims. Mm -hmm. She might have been one of the victims. I also will be, uh, before, before 20, uh, 2011, 
somehow I got recruited by somebody. To, I went to a union hall on I think on 23rd Street and helped make banners for for, for and I marched in the commemoration, you know, down that, Broadway. That parade was unbelievable. What they do is I had a few pictures which I sort of glossed over quickly. But right by the building, they have a shirtwaist banner with a sash with every single victim's name on it. And um, there, it's beautiful. And when, as people are holding them and walking with them, it almost looks like the women are walking to work. It, it's very, very moving. Um, I actually got to hold Annie Nicholas's banner last year. It was, it was really exciting. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, I had a question for um, Dustin. But Dustin, okay. <laughs> uh, what, what piqued your interest? What, what got you interested in this in the first place? Uh, well, it was originally a school assignment, and we, were, uh, we had a theme for a competition, which was pretty much a tragedy that came out to be a triumph. And I was sort of uh, looking around, and a couple of things piqued my interest, but um, I sort of set on this one because uh, it seemed to just think that I wanted to do something I uh, didn't really uh, learn about. Um, and it also seemed pretty, like I, have, I had a lot of people to talk to and a lot of people, a lot of resources to look to uh, to get a lot of information on it. So. I think that says a lot about the triangle shirtwaist in general is how many people continue to care about this. And, you can see. I mean, it's a, it's actually incredible how it just keeps going on and on, and everybody interprets it in their own way. Um, yes. Well, I was just wondering uh, what, how the NYU, uh, how NYU, the top people there, feel about this. Um, well, Richard could probably talk more about that. But <laughs> in general, I think they've been pretty cooperative about it. As, um, as cooperative as anyone can. Exactly. I mean, you know, honestly, it's, it's, it's their building. Um, they were very, very nice to let the family descendants come up and see what's going on there now. They have had the plaques there, but to do this memorial is, 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 is a way bigger step. Um, but in general, I, with all the bureaucracy we had to deal with, I don't think NYU was a major obstacle. In, in doing that. Would you agree? No. <laughs> uh, but they've been allowing it to happen up to this point, and now that everyone has their ducks in a row, uh, all the money, not all the money, but much of the money is ready to go. Contracts are signed. So at this point, they are becoming more people. So thank you. Okay, well, that was a balanced answer. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Yes? What, what were these women working on? What, what's the shirt weights? Oh, um, I described what a shirt waist was. Um, basically, it was a, a white, like the way men now wear white shirts is like your official shirt. Shirt waist with shirt waist with the official fashionable shirt for young ladies at that time period. The Gibson girl um, time period with. Yeah, they're white with slightly puffy sleeves. It has a very distinctive look to it. If you just Google shirtwaist, you'll you'll see it. It's not really that stylish anymore, but it was all the rage then. That's true. That's true. Um, oh, I do want to point out also that there's a picture of Annie Nicholas, that the descendant. You see the regular picture that I showed before, but there's a colorized version, and the colorized version really brings her to life. That was done by Alan Richards, who's a, another artist, but he actually is the one that uh, couldn't make it today, so Jennifer was nice enough to pitch in. But I just want you to see that there, there was more interpretations than, than um, we talked about on stage. Does anybody else have any more questions? Yes? I just wondered from the, uh, the engineer, did, did the unions and the burgeoning union movement, do they, do they have any input on personal safety in New York City? Uh, building codes and unions. Um, no, not really. Okay. Not really. Uh, building codes are gen building codes are part of the. They become part of the law in the cities in which they were adopted. So, for the longest time, New York City wrote its own code, right? So they were essentially writing the laws that would have to go through the city council or whatever the bureaucracy is here in the city. 
Um, the uh, codes that are written by other organizations like the Life Safety Code, NFPA, which I mentioned before, it was, they were originally written as recommendations or standards. They had to rewrite, they had to reword their documents so that their language could more easily be adopted in the laws by um, different municipalities that wanted to adopt them. But in terms of unions, I mean, unions always have an influence on lawmakers, yeah. right? Uh, one way or the other. So uh, did, it, did they play a role? Probably, uh, but somewhere in the background. Okay, just one more and then we'll all call it a night. Yes? Um, two, okay, two quick questions. Okay, first, thanks to all of you. You really, not to use a pun here, but stitch together yeah. a very moving um, picture of all of this vertically, horizontally, uh, from the heart, from the science. <coughs> thanks to the preservation for getting it to us. My fast question is Will there be something happening at this location coming ahead on this March 25th? And secondly, <coughs> when will this memorial, we hope, be installed? It's been even really <laughs> But um, we, we, uh, it's possible that it will be installed in the winter of 2020. Um, we have to work around a uh, calendar of construction <coughs> that's partially NYU or the city, so it could be. Very soon. Yes, a, a very, very good point. Um, if you look at the Remember the Triangle Factory um, fire, the fire, I listed their website here under Richard's name, they have a calendar of, of events that really go all, all year round with all different um, performances and lectures and all sorts of things. Um, the actual day of the fire, they do have a parade by NYU with that shirtwaist parade that I was talking about before, and that chalk project also goes on every single year. I really think that the, the main resource would be the Remember the Triangle um, website, and then you can really learn about everything. But um, I've given lectures at Elridge Street Synagogue, um, many synagogues and churches and libraries and things like that. Um, March seems to be the month because it's Women's History Month, um, and that's why uh, the Grand Village Society did it now. But yet, but it's, it's actually pretty endless, and I was really pleasantly surprised how we get big crowds every, every single time. So there's always something happening with that, and we regenerate this book, too. Um, okay, I think we're done. Thank you so much. Please, uh, please, 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 please,